Coach, what's the health status of everybody, and is everybody healthy enough to play on Sunday? Uh, I'm, uh, most everybody. We, we've got a couple banged up, but we'll see. Who may not play? Uh, I have to see him practice today. Um, uh, JDR did not practice yesterday. Um, I think he might have been the only one. Um, but we got we got some guys banged up. I mean, uh, Milos and Javier, neither one played in the uh, scrimmage. Um, uh, Milos had been practicing, but you know, I just go day to day. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure we'll have five or six, seven or eight ready to that can play. So whoever's ready to play will play. The ones that don't play won't play. Thank you, Chris. We'll go to Terrence Harris with the Houston Defender. Terrence, please go ahead. Hey, Coach, how you doing? Good. Hey, just wanted to ask you about Juwan and kind of, you know, what what does he mean to 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 this program and and, and how have you seen him evolve over these years? Who's that? Juwan Roberts. Okay. Um, you know, well, like a lot of our kids, he was 17 years old when he got to campus. Um, <clears throat> and I knew right away, you know, when I evaluate a kid, you, you know right away whether he's going to be a contributor his first year. Most of them will not. You know, most freshmen are not ready to play. Mm -hmm. If you're a, if you're a, uh, a rebuilding team, um, freshmen can play on those teams. But at this level, it's just hard for a freshman to play. He's on a ranked team. Um, they usually don't play on those teams. So I, I knew J1 would probably redshirt. I thought the value of his redshirt would be um, Bryson, Gresham, uh, uh, Bryson, uh, Justin, Reggie, Fabian. You know, we had a lot of really good players um, at that position for him to learn from. I thought that would be valuable from him. So he's gone from there to now he's an elder uh, statesman. Um, he, he is, he's uh, commanded respect. Um, you know, the way he does everything is, is done the way uh, I would want it done. Now that doesn't mean I still don't have to get on him occasionally about little things, but um uh, J1 has been a um, a winner. He's evolved into a winner, uh, a leader, someone that uh, coaches and players have great respect for in this program. Um, um, I have a ton. I have a ton of respect and love for that kid. Thanks, coach. You bet. Thank you, Terrence. We go to Chancellor Johnson with KPRC TV. Chancellor, please go ahead. Hey, good morning, Kelvin. How are you? It's good, Chancellor. Hey, good to see you. Um, with the death of uh, Coach Abdur Rahim, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on, on his passing. It was not thoughts on it, but if you had a relationship with him and, and uh, just his impact on the coaching community in general. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoy being one of his uh, mentors. I, I talked to Abdur quite a bit. Um, um, I had him on speakerphone one night. And my and Karen was listening to our conversation. Um, I have a tendency to walk around our house, um, and so she was listening to it. And I remember her saying, "She asked me who it was, and I told her <clears throat> Abdul Rahim's the new coach at South Florida. This was last season. Um, I remember she talking about how classy and how professional um, he was." Us. Um, you know, I was texting back and forth last night with the athletic director, Mike Kelly, for uh, USF. He and I served on some committees uh, uh, together. Um, just deflating. Um, I, I found out about it yesterday after practice. Um, my agent was actually at practice, and I was meeting with him yesterday, and he, he told me about it. And so – I thought I thought about that. You know, last week Tony Bennett retires. That that almost felt like a death in our community, our coaching community. And now, now we have one from a guy that was a rocket ship. This guy was a rocket ship, man. He he was destined. He had it. 
what he did at Kennesaw State. Was it the Ohio State game they almost won? They beat somebody good. Maybe it was, maybe it was I think it was Xavier. Um, you know, that was his hello world moment. And then he goes to South Florida in a year when I think um, – Florida Atlantic and Memphis might have been picked to win the league. And here he comes out of nowhere at a school that really hadn't had a lot of recent success and carries them to a conference championship. Um, all, I, all I could think about it was his wife, uh, his brother, who I also knew, um, his children, um, uh, the, the loss for that family, the basketball community. But the, the that wife and that family, what a beautiful family. What a beautiful man. I just it's just sad. Just just hurts you. Just hurts your heart. Thank you, Chancellor. We'll go to Joseph Duarte from the Houston Chronicle. Joseph, please go ahead, sir. Hey, good morning, Kelvin. Good morning. Kelvin, yesterday after practice talking with Kellen, we, we were talking about JoJo and his freshman year and, and what you guys put on his plate. And, and Kelly mentioned that in year two, you really put even more. I was curious from, from your perspective, what would you like to see on that plate in terms of his progress and, and how he develops from the first year to the second? Um, eliminate mistakes. You know, the one thing freshmen, I think what freshmen do best uh, is make mistakes. I mean, they're really, really good at it. Um because to them, basketball is a game of great plays. And to me, it's a game of eliminating mistakes. So you have two counter thought processes going right away. You know, um, to this point in their career, turnovers like a missed free throw. It's okay. Get back. Well, I, I don't like I don't like mental mistakes. Uh last year I think um I think I'm right on this. If I'm not, then I apologize, but I think we led the nation last year in fewest turnovers. Uh, that's not an accident. Um, you know, if I played uh, Mercy and Chase 40 minutes right now, we'd lead the nation in the most turnovers. Uh, but that's what freshmen do in September and October. You know, but November, December, January, February, uh, they start, you know, a lot of them look, but they don't see. So a lot of them here, and they're not, they don't always listen. You know, two of the most valuable things you can teach a young man is how to listen and follow instructions. Um, you know, that, that thing coming out of my mouth, that noise you hear is not something to cause vibrations inside your eardrum, son. There's actually words that are meant to be followed. So they have to learn that. Um, and then the uh, looking and seeing, you know, they look, but they don't see. Um, Jojo was a lot like that last year. He's making better decisions. The game is, slow, is slowing down for him. And he's got more experience. You know, sophomores are better than freshmen. You know, I, I remember our, our last game against Miami thinking, man, I wish I had Jairus one more year. Not that I, did, I knew I would. I just knew how much better he would be his second year. Uh, knew he was gone, obviously. But uh, that second year... Um, they're not running a play, they're executing the play. You know, they're not just getting game, they're not just excited about being on the court and getting playing time. They're actually can see how they can help the team win. So it's, it's part of the process with JoJo. Um, JoJo's a really, really good player. Uh, he does a lot of things organically that we don't have to teach him. You know, his, his length and his activity. Um, his athleticism, you know, when he plays hard, he creates problems. Thank you. We'll go back to Terrence Harris, please. Terrence, go ahead. Hey, hey Kelvin, with Jamal gone now, how how does uh, LJ's role change and your your expectations for him change this season? Yeah, um, I'd like to see LJ be a little more aggressive. You know, LJ. Is such a uh, good decision maker. So I <clears throat> doesn't have a lot of turnovers. <clears throat> Our offense will look different this year because the way we played offense last year is the way that team had to play to win. Um, and obviously, <clears throat> they were excellent at it. 
because they knew how to win. <clears throat> you know, um, don't ever lose sight of the fact that the the the, um, the goal in the game is not to impress anybody or to have you leave talking what how great we are. The goal is to win. Don't, don't ever lose sight of that. You know, there's there's a reason we were 32 and five. <clears throat> And we're almost really, really close to being 33 and five uh, because we knew how to win. Now, we may not have impressed you along the way, and that's okay. We're not here for that. But that LJ reflects that more than anybody. You know, LJ does a good job of making the right reads. You know, um, I call it playing in traffic. If he, if he drives in a gap, if he drives a gap and the help defender comes, he always moves the ball. You know, uh, like Mercy now, if he tries to make gap help and it comes, Mercy's trying to figure out how to beat the help defender, which usually leads to a turnover. Uh, but that's what freshmen do. They have to learn how to play. But um, LJ has a quick release. So uh, I, I told him to really focus on his window. When he has a window that he can get it off, it's okay if it's being contested. That's how much confidence I have in him as a shooter. Same with Emmanuel. You know, they may, I'll let a good shooter shoot contested shots. The best contested shot shooter that I've had since I've been here was Armani Brooks. Armani Brooks was a great contested shot shooter. Um, uh, so was uh, Corey Davis, um, Marcus. Because those guys are on the first guy on the scouting report when it comes, you can't let them have a window. But when you have a window, you have to take advantage of it and be aggressive pull that thing. Um, so I, I would say that's the uh, biggest difference. Uh, Terrence in his role is, is look for his window a little more and uh, be aggressive. Thanks coach. Thank you, Terrence. We'll go to Kenneth Bowman from gokooks.com. Kenneth, please go ahead, sir. How you doing coach? Good. Uh, we seen Jojo yesterday. He was uh, taking some threes in practice, working on his uh, game. Does he have the green light to take those during the no. game? No. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Kenneth. We'll go back to Chancellor Johnson, please. Chancellor, go ahead. Hey, Kelvin. Uh, during these scrimmages and scrimmages and exhibitions, obviously it gives uh, you guys an opportunity to get a different look from uh, somebody else. But how much can you, as a coaching staff, use it as opportunities as well to get back into a little bit more game planning as far as uh, just getting your guys get back into the flow of maybe a little bit of scouting, scouting as far as just execution, like say, as an example, um, with a certain player, hey, you want to do this with a player and seeing if they can maybe execute that and use yeah. those as some, some reps as well. Yeah, there's a balance there. Um, I mean, we certainly have to get ready for next Monday night. But um, I'd say the scrimmage that we had last Saturday, um, Milos did not play. Javier did not play. So my goal in that scrimmage was to see how how we played without him. You know, what, what packages could we run for a backup point guard? Um, uh, gave me a chance to play... Um, uh, Jake, Jacob had, uh, had an ankle sprain. So I, he, he wasn't full go. He played a little bit, but not much, uh, but gave me an extended look at said, for instance, um, you know, um, so I'm still in that mode. I'm, I'm not into a game plan mode or, um, you know, I, I know what I'm looking for in the scrimmage. I know what I'm looking for, um, in the game uh, Sunday, um, I'm still evaluating. Um, you know, I, in these games, or, or some games, there's certain guys who are just not going to play a lot. But this this game is 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 irrelevant in a lot of ways, and it allows me to, regardless of the score, put some guys in there, see how they react. You know, they may react poorly, and we wind up uh, losing. Uh, I, I'm not going to remember that this time next week, and I don't care about that. It's it's an exhibition game. It's not the game to decide the conference championship. It's October the, the twenty. What date is what date is the game? I don't even know. Twenty whatever it is. What's the date of the day? 
twenty um October seventh, uh, I guess. So yeah, I mean, you know, we'll be doing different things. We'll throw a start lineup out there and we'll have we'll mix and match lineups that we we'll, won't see all year probably, but um that's what this game's for to us. I have no idea how AM approaches it. Um I would think Buzz is probably gonna be uh similar, but you know, it doesn't matter. Thank you, Chancellor. We'll go back to Chris Gardner, please. Chris, go ahead. Coach, how have Cordell and Jacob progressed now going to the second year with the program? They're coming along. You know, they're not, um, um, you know, you, when you have 14 guys on the roster, and you play nine, so there's five guys that's probably not going to play a lot. And so um, you say, why aren't they playing? But the easy answer is they're not in the top nine. You know, would you like me to take LJ out and put Cordell in so Cordell can play? No, that's not the way it works. You know, we have our top group, and this ain't this ain't no uh, democracy around here. You you know, once the game start, um, you know, you're not trying to play 14 guys 10 minutes apiece. That's a pretty good recipe to get your ass beat. You know, your best players should play the minutes and. And everybody has a chance to be in that group. Uh, and if you are, you're going to play a lot. If you're not, keep working. You, you'll get there eventually. Be patient. Have the right attitude. That's the great thing about uh, Cordell and um, all of our young guys. You know, Cordell's a freshman. It's hard to play freshman at this level if you're uh, uh, competing for conference championships. Um, they usually sit over there and learn and uh, get better as they go. So, um that goes, that goes uh, unless you're a Marcus Sasser. He's a pro. Um, Jairus Walker, he was a pro. Um, uh, we've got some freshmen that are a little bit further along than other freshmen. Uh, Jamon Mark, uh, when he was a freshman, um, he didn't get a lot of minutes, but he got enough. Now, Jamal didn't get any minutes. If uh, – Cordell averaged five minutes a game. That'd be probably be more than Jamal played. <laughs> so freshman just uh, Jamal was on a Final Four team. Those are the hardest teams to play on. There's a reason they're on the Final Four is because they're not playing the freshmen. Don't don't I, I know I've said this before, but the year we went to the Final Four, the two top recruiting classes in the nation that year was Duke and Kentucky. Neither one made the tournament because they played their freshmen. That's the way it works. So. Some of these guys don't play. Figure it out. You don't need to ask me why they're not playing. We'll go to Dayon Dunlap, please. Dayon, please go ahead. Hey, how you doing, Coach Sampson? Hey, Dayon. Uh, this is kind of piggyback off of you kind of talked about LJ um, expanding his role in this upcoming year with Jamal going. Kind of speak about Emmanuel and offensively, will he um, expand his game more with this, with the way you guys play with this team this year? Some games, yes. Some games, no. I mean, uh, I, I would think Emmanuel um, will take a jump this year, um, LJ. But those guys are also the first two guys on the scouting report. Teams will approach them differently. So that doesn't automatically mean they're going to score more points. You know, Jamal took a lot of pressure off those guys last year. Um, you know, LJ kind of stepped into Marcus Sasser's role uh, last year, and Emmanuel kind of start stepped into Jamon's role, uh, just like Jamon and Marcus stepped into Tajay and Kyler's role. I mean, every year I've got a different cast of characters. Uh, you know, I, I I don't think I change a whole lot. Uh, I certainly evolve when I need to, but um, I, I also know that if we were playing uh, LJ, he wouldn't get a lot of the looks he gets. So when you play really good defensive teams, your numbers are going to look differently, uh, obviously. So, uh, you know, when, uh, I think we were 17-0 and at home last year. Sometimes you have to look at us when we go on the road, how we play. It's the same reason we struggle on the road sometimes is why teams struggle at our place. It's hard to play really good teams at their, in their gym. Your offense is not look, going to look really good. Your defense may not be as effective either. 
but um, Emmanuel and um, LJ, um, I would think would be our two leading uh, scores uh, this year. Uh, at least they should be. We'll go to Joseph Duarte again. Joseph, please go ahead. Yelvin, <clears throat> excuse me. As as another season begins and the goals are are obviously there, uh, I'm curious for for the uninitiated when when you get into a season, how perfect. I don't and I don't even know if perfect's the word, but how well do things have to go to get to that ultimate Monday night where you're cutting the nets with you know whether it's injuries or a team that gets hot in in March. I mean, does it just have to sometimes just go absolutely perfect for a team or close to it? Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've had some teams I thought could play on Monday night. That 22 team probably could. Um, you know, we had a historically bad shooting day. How often is that going to happen? Um, you know, uh Losing Jamal when we did against Duke, um, and I know people said, well, if we hadn't lost Jamal, we might would have won. I think that's disrespectful to Duke, um, and I, I don't like doing that to other teams. I don't like when my team played a great game and we won, and people said, well, you wouldn't have won if this guy hadn't got hurt. You know, Duke, Duke might have beat us anyway. Who knows? Um, I thought the loss to JoJo was the one that really turned – uh, the season sideways for us because we didn't have a third post. Uh, now, your fourth post is there for a reason. You know, you, you've got to get lucky enough. Like the championship game was UConn and Purdue. Those guys played their 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 top eight players early in the season, was healthy in that game. They had nobody out. You know, we had Terrence, we had um, JoJo, <clears throat> and then the last whatever – um, 32, 33 minutes, we didn't have uh, uh, Jamal. That's just a bad break. And when you have those bad breaks and you don't win, you don't sit and feel sorry for yourself or say, well, that was, you know, what, you know, what could have been. I, I don't look at it like that at all. You know, I thought our kids did the best they could all year long. And sometimes it's just it's not good enough. That's just the way it is. Um, um, I remember playing Cincinnati one year when they had, uh, uh, what was the big kid's name? Kenyon Martin. We played Cincinnati that year, and they were by far the best team that we played. We were in a league with Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma State. All those teams were, were great. But the best team we played all year was Cincinnati. And had he not gotten hurt, um, they would have been a one seed, and I think that would have been hard to beat. Uh, but that happens in athletics. So – um uh whoever you pick whoever you think is going to win a championship there's a much better chance that they won't win it than there is that they will because of all the things that's out of their control you know uh you, you have a one for 20 night nobody's trying to do that sometimes that ball don't go in uh sometimes you come down and a guy's foot slides under your foot Step on his, you step on it, your foot goes sideways, and your ankle swells up, and you can't play anymore. What, what, what do you want to do? Sit, sit around and feel sorry for yourself or cry because you lost the game? No, um, it, th this is a journey, and to me, the journey's always been way more important than the destination. That's what I will remember the most: is the journeys with this team. Now, if you're not a, if you're not inside the arena, all you care about is the destination because you're not in the arena. You know, for the coaches and players that are uh, dedicating their lives to helping each other and going through this thing we call a basketball season uh, to be judged on one game at the end, uh, <laughs> that's pretty shallow. But that's you know that's the way it is, and you, you accept it and you move on. But it doesn't bother the people in the arena. You get disappointed, um, like last year and the year before. But um, one of these years, you catch a break, and you don't have any injuries. Things go your way. Instead of going one to one for 20, maybe you go five for 20. <laughs> and those, and those uh, 
shots make a difference. Our problem with that game was we we made too many against Arizona on uh, the first round, the Sweet 16 game, and then we just didn't have we we didn't have any left in our pocket for that uh, Villanova game. So, um, but I enjoyed the journey. I really do. I love this team. Uh, I love our staff. Uh, I love our program. Um, and and we get after it every day, doing the best we can to get better. And sometimes you throw it, you throw your team out there, and maybe they don't. Those balls don't go in that night, or your your freshmen forget what color jersey they're wearing. You just sometimes you never know. That's why that's why you go play the game. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for two more questions, please. Before the TV, we'll go to uh, Chris Baldwin, please. Chris, go ahead. Hey, Calvin. Um, B- Buzz Williams has called you one of his uh, coaching heroes. W- what did you see in him, you know, as a young coach w- when you first, you know, got to know him? Uh, first of all, Buzz is extremely, extremely uh, well respected in this profession. Um, he's won everywhere he's been. His teams always play the right way. Um, and Buzz is a, but Buzz has a unique curiosity about him. He's a helper. He's a giver. He changes people's lives, and and he loves doing it. Um, you know, we kind of, you know, when I'm out and about in July, sitting at these events, and my eyes are crossed by watching the um, my seventh game in the last eight hours of uh, of uh, either really good or really bad basketball. You have a tendency to guys will come over and sit beside you or want to ask questions or, or just talk and chat. Um, um, you know, and I've got a bunch of friends, really good friends in this uh, profession, but um, uh, Buzz and I, we've had a lot of interesting conversations uh, over the years and, um, I'm really proud of Buzz. I, I really am. He's he's um, he, he's he's one of the pillars in our coaching profession, and his work ethic, his curiosity, his passion for uh, wanting to grow the game, grow himself, so he can so he can help other people. I think has always been distinguishable to me. Thank you, Chris. We'll go to the last question here today. We'll go to Randy McElvoy from KPRC. <laughs> Randy, let's go ahead. Hey, Kelvin, how are you? Um, hey, wanted hey. to ask you a question now that the season, you know, it's close to getting started, and a lot of these guys have been together since uh, when you guys went open in June with conditioning, so on and so forth. When it comes to the culture of your program, how much do you rely on your veteran players to instill that in your young guys or guys coming into the program versus as a coaching staff uh, how do y'all deliver the culture? What's the well, how, don't ever lose sight of this, Randy. Coaching staff and the strength coach doesn't set the culture. The head coach does. There's only one person that can establish the culture. Uh, when Kellen's a head coach, Quarnas is a head coach, Hollis is a head coach, Casey is a head coach, their staff will not their their staff will not establish their culture. Their staff has to buy in to the head coach's culture. Everybody has responsibility of that, but it's not a group project. You know, so, you know the head coach is 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 has to set it, as he has to know the standards that he wants. Um, I set the standard, and um, my uh, veteran guys uh, every year. You know, when Galen Robinson and Rob Gray. Daniel Dotson, I don't, I don't coach the team with our standards, and, uh, which leads to our, our uh, expectations and our um, responsibilities and accountabilities. Um, uh, that's my job every day is to make sure that we're doing things the way uh, uh, I see them through my vision. And then these guys, are, their job is to make sure that, that uh, they understand that and they hold the other guys accountable uh, for that. But I'd rather teach responsibility than accountability. You know, 
accountability, for instance, is if I see somebody, somebody's walking down the stairs and, and somebody has dropped a wrapper, piece of trash, you know, if you walk, walk by and you pick that up, that means you're responsible. If you walk by and you don't pick it up and somebody uh, admonishes you or makes you run because you didn't pick up the trash, that's accountability. I'd much rather responsibility than accountability. And I think that's what makes our program what it is, is that uh, the, the hard part here is not that we've won at a high level, is that we've done it for seven years. Is is this that our our model has sustained itself? Um, you know, this year we're replacing Jamal. How do you replace Jamal? Well, I've had that same question for seven years. How, how do you how do you replace Devin Davis and Rob Gray, Corey Davis, Galen, Armani Brooks, Bryson, Chris? Reggie, uh, Kyler Edwards, Tajay Moore, Fabian White, Josh Carlton, uh, Marcus Sasser, Jarris Walker, uh, Tremont Mark, um, and and now it's uh, Jamal and Damian Dunn. You know, uh, next year somebody's going to be asking me about replacing J. Juan Roberts, L.J. Cryer. Uh, but um, our our culture is is established here. <clears throat> Because it's my job every day to uphold our culture. And then when I recruit kids, I recruit kids I think can fit our culture. Um, but, um, you know, recruiting is so much evaluation. And I do re try to recruit great kids. And that's what I'm most proud of. It's not not just the winning, but it's the kind of kids we have. You know, you, you, you guys have a job to do. <clears throat> you guys do a great job of uh, interviewing our guys. And I would hope for that you would see that, that they're really good guys. They're good kids. They come from good parents. And they fit our culture here. Um, and that's one of the things that makes our culture so good is that we have great – our assistant coaches are such good people. Uh, our managers are good people. Uh, our players are really good people. So um, when you have that and you run into your inevitable adversity – you're, you're much able to handle it. Last year, we had a two-game losing streak uh, at Iowa State and at TCU. Well, we're going to have some two-game losing streaks this year, too. You know, everybody in this league is going to have losing streaks. Um, how other people uh, react to that will be completely different than how we react to it. So, but the character of our kids have a lot to do with how you handle any kind of adversity. So, um but that that culture thing comes down to um, and and whatever like Villanova's culture. That Villanova culture wasn't started by their director of basketball operations or one of the assistant coaches. That was Jay Wright. Um, same thing with Buzz Williams. They have a great culture at Texas A and M. Their offensive rebound is off the charts. You know we've been a really good offensive rebounding team here for a long time. But we're, we're not as good as they are. They're, they're better than us. That's something that I admire from them.